Uh, and when you actually add in formal to your informal learning, you start to learn that your informal learning is pretty limited. Like you get habituated to certain types of persuasion uh, versus being able to look at the whole range of persuasion and make choices about what might work best. Hello and welcome to the Culture Thing podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Rogers, and this is episode 61. And today I'm talking with Dr. Dan French. Dan, how are you, buddy? Welcome to the Culture Things podcast. Hey, I've been uh, looking forward to the Culture Things podcast. It's good to be here. I've been looking forward to have you on. I'm going to, uh, just so we can share a little bit of your background and build up some credibility, mate, I'm going to go through a bit of your bio so the listeners can have a bit of an understanding of who the hell this guy is sitting in Austin, Texas. Sound all right? Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. All righty. So Dan has always had three careers. He's an educator and language-centric intellectual. He taught rhetoric, persuasion, TV writing, screenwriting, communication studies at university level for almost two decades. He's an entertainment professional. Dan was a professional stand-up comedian for 30-plus years, as well as a pro comedy writer and producer for many TV and film projects. He's also an organizational consultant and marketer who has advised and worked for companies and organizations as diverse as fertility startups and the Naval War College. Now, Dr. Dan is literally the only person in the world with two Emmy nominations for late night comedy writing and a PhD in rhetoric. He is the co-creator of Heft, which is the world's best online business bio builder. And he's also the host of the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. And Dan says, Rhetoric Warriors is a way to improve how we do persuasion in a culture so that we learn how to persuade, counter persuade, de persuade, and defend against all forms of unethical persuasion. The focus of our convers conversation today is the art of persuasion. Dan, you sound like a pretty credible, credible sort of dude. Yeah, there's some stuff in there. I've got some, uh, I've got some degrees, I've got some places. So clearly, lots of credibility you've been around you've been around in a good way mate yeah i've done some stuff for sure <laughs> now how about you i mentioned austin texas there's this is like is austin texas now the world's most famous town because joe rogan lives there what, what's going on in this place why is it so cool um well as the pandemic spread out and destroyed the economy and the coasts imploded and everybody was forced to live inside, they suddenly started thinking, why am I paying all this rent in California and New York? Where else could I go? And Austin basically advertises itself as a little coast, well, little coastal city. It's liberal, it's supposed to have a media a scene, it's supposed to be cool and hip. So they all w rushed here and Joe Rogan led the, he led the comet, you know, dragging them all behind him well i'm not sure about rogan mate you've been in austin texas for a while so maybe they uh maybe they following you realized the the good things all of a sudden yeah i suddenly jumped up into the collective consciousness and they're like that guy <laughs> living in that two-bedroom house in austin that's where we need to go yeah. absolutely mate. well look, i'm so glad i met you we had a great conversation uh, a few weeks ago now and thanks to our producer and my business partner mark who who made the introduction for us so mate absolutely fantastic to have you on the podcast today Let, let's get into our topic you've got this phd in rhetoric do you just want to tell us what the hell is this topic <laughs> rhetoric yeah usually when people hear the word rhetoric they challenge me about whether it's real you know that is that a real degree i've never heard of that degree and rhetoric itself has been limited down into a small subset of rhetoric, which is political rhetoric, empty rhetoric. So you, when people talk about rhetoric, oh, that's just rhetoric, meaning hollow talk, meaning talk that's florid and designed, but is hiding something. So that's, that's the culture's main definition for rhetoric. And a lot of times when I put rhetoric warriors up there or tell people rhetoric, they look at me suspiciously. And then the second uh, element of it is that it's manipulation, that anybody who studies persuasion must be doing manipulation. And that comes from all the social science issues of like the 50s when they were, you know, putting music cues inside your, your, uh, 
Muzak when you're at, at McDonald's to make you eat faster, and the commercials were s- subliminal messages. So rhetoric is kind of slandered uh, in the culture. But if you actually understand what rhetoric is, it studies persuasion uh, all the way back from the Greeks, pre-Socratics, to the, uh, to the sophist, a pre-sophist, to uh, Aristotle, and all the way to, to now, which is postmodern, hypermodern theory about language use in public. So rhetoric, just the simplest definition, I made my kids rem- uh, learn this when they were little, because they were like, what do you do? I'm like, I study effective messaging. That's the most <laughs> condensed definition I have. It's, it's message effectiveness. So what can you do to a message to make it, to maximize its effectiveness with an audience? There you, you go. Must have... Two minutes. That's my whole field. Well, my, that's, that's, should we end the episode now? I think everybody's got more than they, they can <laughs> digest already. <laughs> well, I, I, again, I, I don't know how many times I say this on a podcast episode, but it always fascinates me is how people get into their spaces that, you know, they enjoy and love. So, yeah, you know, you've been in this space a long time. You've got a PhD in it. What was it about this sort of field that fascinated you so much to do the, the level of study you've done? Well, most people learn influence. Everybody knows um, about influence. Everybody uses influence in their lives. You can't avoid it as a human being. So when you walk out the door, you have chosen clothes because mm. you know how they're going to be interpreted basically that day. So that's, that is a rhetorical act to match your clothing messaging to what you intend to get done that day or to avoid problems with certain target audiences because you know they won't like the way you're dressed. So we are constantly doing informal structuring of messaging. It's just you don't do it with formal study. Uh, And when you actually add in formal to your informal learning, you start to learn that your informal learning is pretty limited. Like you get habituated to certain types of persuasion uh, versus being able to look at the whole range of persuasion and make choices about what might work best. So what got me interested in this was that sense of range of rhetoric. It literally can study any form of human messaging. And that goes from politics to philosophy, to business, sales, really anything, relationships. You don't, when you talk to your wife, you're married, right? I am. Okay. You adjust how you talk. You have a way. Lovely wife, I should say. Absolutely (laughs) lovely wife. Which I love her dearly. Right. You have you have a wife terminology, you have a <laughs> wife language, and you've developed it, and it works, I assume. Most of the time. Yeah. You know, you have to go to some of your alternatives when there are certain stressful situations. You've got other things, but you've developed that with that person. So it's a set of messaging that's very unique to you, even though it's generic to probably males in a certain culture and a certain way of, of doing relationships, but you've adapted it, scripted it, and now it works in your life. And so when you study rhetoric, you can literally go, I want to study how people do that with films. How do they make successful documentaries? Uh, I, I want to study that with conversations. How do people create successful conversations? And so that's what attracted me at first. It's just, you can study anything. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an area that opened my eyes, just doing a bit of study on yourself and research and trying to understand the topic a little bit more so that I can ask you some meaningful questions today. And I was just fascinated with the link to some of the work that I do around leadership and culture and, you know, the foundations. So particularly through your book, you know, The 21 Colosseums, which I've read, absolutely fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Loved it. Like, there's a term you use, and when I met you, we talked about ethical versus unethical persuasion. Can you unpack that a bit for us so we understand it? Yeah, so I brand rhetoric warriors as the power of ethical-only persuasion. And the reason that is is because I, I jumped back into this. Like I taught for 20 years in universities to 18-year-olds way before they were ready to hear this stuff. And then... When the I, then I went into entertainment full time in TV, and then I started working in marketing and selling persuasion theory and work to businesses. But once the pandemic hit and Trump came over and broke open American politics, and really politics is broken up all, uh, all around the world now. Like we've 
social media has opened up new possibilities for rhetorics, for what I would call rhetoric storms, which is a collective way of talking that has been around for a long time. Like America has always had a far right. It was the KKK. It was people, mm -hmm. they were white supremacists. It was all these small, tiny groups. And suddenly the things, the way that they talk has now gotten into the mainstream and it's through social media. Like network TV would never have left that, let that stuff in. Fox mm -hmm. came in and opened the door and let a lot of it in. And then cable let a lot of it in. Uh, right wing uh, AM radio was the first place where it all got in. Before that, it was them handing out flyers and having secret meetings. So the rhetoric is exactly the same. But national politicians and national organizations and national media outlets are now allowing it. And it's a pretty powerful rhetoric. And America does not know what to do with it. You know, a lot of countries do not know what to do with it. They don't know how to counter it. You know, um, and so we've had to get we're going to have to grow up really fast politically and rhetorically, because my big problem with the right isn't always with the positions. It's with the rhetoric. They use unethical rhetorical techniques to get their message out. So like being non-transparent is a unethical technique. If somebody ever asks me what I'm trying to get in a situation, I'll tell them. I'm very transparent about my motives. I'll tell them what techniques I'm going to use. I'm very open because that's, that's an ethical approach to messaging. When you're trying to be dodgy and make things slick and difficult to penetrate, that's not really ethical rhetoric. That's unethical rhetoric that is trying to hide your motives and hide your techniques. And the right is incredibly based on unethical rhetorical techniques. So it's, it's dangerous. Like that's, that's dangerous to a, a public discourse health, the health of your public discourse. It's dangerous to people who don't know how to protect themselves from it. And it's dangerous to your politics. I guess there was a, you know, you're mentioning sort of right and, you know, maybe here we call it far right. And would that not equally apply for say the far left as well? Wouldn't they have their own version of rhetoric? Oh, sure. Everything is a rhetoric. So mm. every, think of it this way. I like to think of it as rhetoric storms. Mm. So if you get any strong perspective, it, it creates this collection of, of words and beliefs and images mm. and attacks and all this stuff. And it becomes its own little storm and you can access it. Um, but the far left uses different, very different rhetoric than the far right. And again, it goes back to technique. I tell people a lot of times when I have them on my podcast, I don't care what you believe. I like Tony Fauci, Anthony Fauci over here, mm -hmm. head of the, you know, vi vi virus, um, here in head of virus. What was the immunology? <laughs> What's his actual Something title? like that. Yeah, yeah. Something. I think people know his name more than his title. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he's worked with viruses for, you know, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And he's become a polarized figure because he stepped into our politics. Trump drug mm -hmm. him into the politics, put him up in front of everybody on the podium, and then attacked him. And so that's, that's a very traditional political activity, being attacked. Mm -hmm. Most scientists are not used to being attacked. So the question is, is he wonderful? Is he some type of utopian, you know, laudable, great figure? Or is he horrible? Is he the devil? Is he dangerous? I don't care which one you believe. What I care is about the process in the middle of how you get to that belief. So for me, like I typically think the guy seems fine. He seems like a scientist, like he, he's ethical. He cares about people. He's trying to do all these things. And I can show you evidence of when he says these things and why I think that way. If you take it to the right, they're showing, they're making claims a lot of times without evidence or their evidence is very thin. And so I really care about that. Like if you're making thin claims based on wispy evidence, that's a problem for a rhetorician. So it's the process that matters, not really the conclusions. Mm. And I have heard and, and watched some of that through your episodes in Reddit Warriors and, and some of the conversations you've had. What strikes me as, again, fascinating is that you must have an extreme level of self-awareness 
to remain so calm in the conversations you're having. And I guess that if, if I've understood some of the information in 21 Colosseums of Persuasion book that you've written, that fits fairly and squarely into the ethos side. W would that be right? Yeah, it's... So there's so many persuasion techniques. The reason why mm. I, I wrote 21 Colosseums and started with that is Aristotle's major definition of persuasion. It's been the dominant definition of rhetoric and persuasion for 2,500 years, mm. ever since he wrote it, is a rhetorician is someone who is able to see all the available means of persuasion and choose the right one. And in order to do that, you first have to see all the available <laughs> options. And that's what's really missing in an, like an informal learning approach to persuasion. There may be very persuasive salespeople, for example, who learn through an occupation. They learn through trial and error, through experimentation, through observation. They may take some courses. They may read some books. And they get to a point where they may be good in this one area. But you lift them out of that, take them over here, and drop them like into a parenting role. And they do what's called perseveration. They continue to use the techniques over here, over here where they don't apply, they don't have the same strength, they're, they're inappropriate. What a rhetorician will do is go, oh no, here's the grid. There's 21 big arenas. Mm. I'm going to move out of logic entirely. I may not even use language. I may move over here and just do relationship building. Mm. So I have two kids and I did basically, I tell them they are 20 year rhetorical experiments because guinea pigs i designed them to accept my forms of persuasion i trained them from very very young ages because i wanted them to accept the way i like to persuade and i did it on purpose and i told them i did it can, can i just say that almost sounds like mothers to me I, I know you're a father but that almost sounds like mothers yeah i think mothers are very cognizant uh, of structures using the same structure so the kids adjust to it mm. like a mom once a mom has a strong theory really hard to get her off of it mm. like one of the theories i hear a lot is to set boundaries for kids and then fall through with consequences and you have to be consistent you know and all this and i'm like well maybe and i get it i get why that would be a an acceptable system i didn't do that with my kids because I didn't want my kids to feel like they were boundaries. I don't, mm. I grew up Catholic in a working class neighborhood, which was very heavy in boundaries. And mm. I don't like that feeling. I want them to not have the feeling of there are always limits around me. I want them to have the feeling of I'm free to do many things, but I'm going to make a good choice here because I know it's going to work out best for me. And that's very different than imposing structures around them. Like I'm imposing, hey, look at your options. Here's some ways to process those. And now make a choice that you think is going to work out really well for you. There you go. And so I've trained them to do that. <laughs> like what, what are you trying to achieve on this journey? Like there's rhetoric warriors. You know, there's your background PhD in rhetoric. Your courses on your website are extremely well priced. You know, you talk about it's not about sort of the extreme level of price. It's just getting into as many people's hands as possible. There's got to be some something driving that. You know, 25 US dollars, I think, for for a couple of your courses. I mean, it's, it's fantastic value for what you get. What is it? That, what is that driver? What are you trying to achieve through this journey you're on? There's a big communication requirement um, on my side with this stuff, like. Even the idea of going, hey, there are 21 big areas here, and each one of those needs its own book, maybe mm. two or three books. Like the book that I started working on right after I finished 21 Coliseums was why, and again, it's American-centric, but uh, why, why America can't think. Like what has happened to our capacity to do rational thought? And it turns out if you actually look at what's happened, like the way that the, the mind is affected by things like media, by things like speed culture. Um, our brains are not adapted to this. 
And so it's broken down some of the basic rationality structures that we've learned. And then you look at the fact that nobody gets trained in logic like or rationality. Sometimes people maybe take a class here. They might take a little math. Some philosophers will get some logic. But the vast majority of the population is just doing their informal understanding of logic. And logic is weird. It's very weird. It's very difficult to learn uh, because it goes astray really easily. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked about this uh, when we were talking before. Like, just take one little concept of logic, a qualifier, which is a very important piece of logic. And what a qualifier does is it lets it sets out the scope of your statement. So sometimes this is important, or this is always important, or this is never important. That word sometimes, never, always changes everything. Mm. And people don't control their qualifiers. So when I talk to people, and that's why it's like, you can never beat a rhetorician in an argument because I'm hearing your, I'm hearing your grid. I'm seeing your matrix. Mm. I'm like, oh, bad with qualifiers. Eh, eh. You know, I'll mess around with that one, see what we can do. I have to say, this is this interview is probably the the most nervous I've been around an interview. Even though we've got a relationship and talking and stuff, I thought, I wonder how Dan's perceiving this whole process. <laughs> but I'm ethical. Even the way I ask my questions. Yeah, you're right? ethical. I'm I know. Ethical I'm not saying you're doing it in a bad way. I'm not saying you do it in a bad way, but just even the way I ask my question, because that's some of the some of the conversation we did have when we met and and some feedback. And I asked you, like, what what is it about, you know, what I'm doing, or even actually, let me ask you, how how's my head movements today when yeah, I, I was going to say question? you you look like you've made some, you know, some adaptations. We I talked do about like you to having... take feedback on. Yeah, what? I do like to take feedback on. Nice. Where, yeah, we where talked appropriate. about nonverbal, you know, behavioral messaging. Like, and most men have learned to be very stable in their, mm. their, uh, body movements and their face movements and head movements. And that's not conducive usually to good conversation or to uh, good relationshiping because it looks like you're not interested. So mm. we talked about you moving your head more and like, I, I did this at the very beginning of when you were introducing me, if people go back and look at the tape, I consciously do this, I'll move. I'll nod, I'll smile while you're talking, because otherwise I'm just sitting here going, you know. I thought you just groove into the beat, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you talked, you mentioned relationships earlier, and I mean, look, on the Culture Things podcast, we're always linking you back to cultural leadership and teamwork. So how important is this relationships coliseum to the whole picture of influence rhetoric persuasion well what i would tell people is this is that book is the starting place like if you read that book you're gonna get oriented to all the things that you need to learn and i try to put a, a few good lessons into each one of those chapters but like one of the chapters uh, talks about situations and organizations are situations they're settings of persuasion and once you walk into a business you have to know its atmosphere, its culture, because those have already set limits on you and expectations and terminologies. And I see this a lot. I've only worked with businesses like the last seven years or so uh, since I started this digital work, digital marketing. But I've, I've learned over time, like the, the language work with, with businesses is so different. I have to kind of rip them out of their comfortable rhetoric storm and bring them over to mine. And I do this consciously. It's one of the reasons why I keep Greek stuff in my uh, instruction in the book. I talk about logos, mythos, ethos, and pathos because I want you to accept my terminology. Everybody wants to throw their my stuff back into their terminology. They'll be like, oh, so you build brands. I'm like, no, I build ethos for companies. And they're like, well, what's that mean? I'm like, now we're in my game because you're having to ask me what it means versus you telling me something about a brand, which to me is a lesser way of it. it it's not that it's bad. It just doesn't have the texture and all the theory and all the tactics that you could pull from persuasion. Once you start looking at brand, it's become very structured for how business does it. 
So I did that to you a number of times, didn't I? In pulling you into my language. Yeah. I, what What am I trying to do there? Like I don't, I, I don't knowingly feel like I'm doing anything, but it, I am. What am I doing? You're retreating to your comfort storm. Mm. Like this is your world. You've worked in corporations and businesses for how many years? Yeah, over twenty. Yeah. So you know it well. You know how people act in that world. You know tones of voice that fit in that world and tones that don't. Mm. Humor that fits and humor that doesn't. You know, so you, you want to bring, and everybody does, they want to bring you back to their storm. One of the things that works in my favor is people haven't spent time in my storm. So it's kind mm. of interesting to them. They're like, I didn't even know that storm was around. <laughs> Yeah, they've been the storm builder, mate. Time. Do you have typhoons and stuff like that in in tech in Austin? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. You're the uh, the creator of these things, mate, from a uh, a wordsmith perspective. Yeah, and words are weapons for rhetoricians. They're mm. locations of dispute. They're lo locations of competition, but they're superpowers. So whoever controls the words is basically going to win the persuasion. So like your, your podcast, the culture of things, I'm not exactly sure what that means, uh, but you immediately define it with something about leadership and teamwork, is it? Mm -hmm. So those are clear business terms, mm -hmm. leadership and teamwork. So what is leadership in a business? Like to me, it's a rhetorician. Mm. Like the head the rhetoric. What I use would be influence. Yeah. But what does influence mean versus rhetoric? See, if you, if I, if I can get you over. I, I'm thing, learning there's no difference. Oh, there's plenty of difference, but it's, it's, um, the terms, the main actions are the same. Like we're both trying mm. to affect another human being. Right. Mm. Yep. So, but the, the way that you do influence, like science tries to own rhetoric as well it calls it persuasion and there's a study of behavioral modification and uh, advertising tries to own it marketing tries to own it philosophy sometimes tries to own it psychology definitely tries to own it mm. but i keep ripping you back and going hey this is go back to the source code this is where the software came from and you're going to get better stuff than what these people are offering you so if I can turn you into a rhetorician, Brendan, and you start thinking, I want to be a rhetorician, then you're going to absorb this new storm and it's going to give you a whole different way of doing all these things. <laughs> I, from reading your book and learning more about you and talking to you, I agree. Can I bring you back into my storm for a minute? Sure. And how do we, this link of rhetoric persuasion you know this whole topic today is the art of persuasion how do we link this back to the business world and the importance around leaders understanding these foundations why is it important that they understand these foundations in whatever they're leading and again i, I want to I, I i'm not sure if using the word qualify is the right way this time but i want to qualify the fact that you know you don't need to be in a role that has people underneath you to be a leader. So what I would do as a rhetorician is step back and go, okay, let's, let's lay this out uh, according to some of the terminologies and the uh, techniques and structures that will make it rhetorical. So say you're a, a boss or a manager or employee, it doesn't really matter, but you start with the fact that, you are given um, certain structure, certain power. Every role has, has some type of power and some types of limits of power. And essentially, every time you get a promotion, they change your power limits. And so if I'm coming into this situation with no power, and I do this a lot of times when I work with companies to try to give them a brand new perspective on what they're doing, which is the rhetorical perspective, I'll walk into the C-suite, you know, as many executives as they can get together, and I'll be like, 
Hey, it's great to meet you guys. Looks like an awesome company. Uh, I need a, I need something here at the beginning, which is you guys have to understand you all have SPS. And they're like, well, what's that? I'm like, that is smart people syndrome. <laughs> I love it. And it gets in my way because you're all very intelligent people. You've got experience. You've got status. You've got ways of thinking about yourself. And you're going to want to get involved like in your messaging construction because you're smart. That doesn't mean you're professionally creative. And a lot of times I'm doing naming or slogan work or characters or stories, things like that for the company. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you need super stories. You need super characters, super slogans, super names, which means you need super professionals to get there. You have to get out of the way because if you're involved in the mix, you're going to limit what these other people are doing because they're going to adjust to you as opposed to doing what they do, which is work with other crazy creatives. Like I can bring people, three people in here right now. And you'll be like, these people are not intelligent, <laughs> at least not as intelligent as you. And at the end of the day, they're going to give you 30 crazy, interesting lines for what you do that y'all could never have gotten to because their brains work linguistically. So mm -hmm. I need you to get understand that you need to get out of the way. And I do it with comedy. So it's a little more palatable. But that's a message a lot of people would like to send up the ladder to their bosses. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you get out of my way, I could probably do this a lot better. Yeah, that is definitely a common message that people think more than say more. Right. And so a rhetorician figures out, how can I say this and be effective, get away with it, not lose status, but actually gain status? And so part of the thing that I have working for me is the PhD gives me credibility. Nobody else in that room has a PhD in rhetoric. The fact that I wrote in Hollywood for 10 years and have Emmy nominations gives me creative credit. And once I talk, they're like, oh, this person seems like he knows what he's talking about. So I get performative credit. And then I can actually get some them to accede to my request a little bit, about 10%. And then they want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, s some would say with a PhD, because not everyone's got a PhD, you, you have smart people syndrome. W where do you have smart people syndrome? Well, I think one of the cool things about rhetoricians is we turn the same analysis on ourselves. <laughs> like you were talking about this before we started. Uh, and what, what's the conclusion? About me? Uh, well, what I... What I know is what my limits are. Like I am expert in certain things, but it does not extend beyond that. When I get outside of my area of expertise, I stop talking like an expert. And this is one of the lessons I think that's really cool about, again, a rhetorical approach is you need to understand your limits because once you go outside of those, you're going to fail. And you see this all the time with people trying to talk outside their area of expertise with some aura of expertise. Politics is the ultimate location of it. Somebody will say, Donald Trump is this. And I'm like, do you know him? Have you, have you ever hung out with him? Have you had any personal interaction? You know anybody that knows him. You've never had any interaction with him whatsoever, and yet you drew this massively concrete conclusion about that person. You do not have any expertise in that. And it's really hard again. I got to go slow, but I got to get, to get them to admit they don't have an expertise in the things they have strong beliefs about. Mm -hmm. And if I can get that, it lowers their, their guard. They quit trying to act expert. And then we can have a discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did this with the Tony Fauci thing. I got, do I have an episode? I guess I have an episode. Yeah, I do with a right wing friend of mine and you know, he was going off about Fauci having no credibility and things like that. And I'm like, well, mm. do you think Fauci knows about viruses, more about viruses than you do? And he just froze. It was so hard for him to give up that expertise that he thinks he has about, I don't trust that guy. And I'm like, fine, that's all yours. But does he have, you know, PhD 50 years runs the National Institute of whatever. Mm -hmm. And he finally could say it. 
He's like, yeah, he, he knows more about medical stuff than I do. Just. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, good. All right. Yes. So I, I am sure I do. Like I, I, but I, I am very aware of what works for me and what works against me. I don't try to persuade in areas I know I'm going to fail. Hmm. What's the point? Yeah, absolutely. The 21 Coliseums of persuasion. And I know that from a rhetorician perspective, you need to be moving around those Coliseums based on the, you know, the awareness of the situation and the, the ecology, the ecosystem. But can you give our listeners some sense of, hey, if this topic has seemed interesting and well, rhetoric, okay, influence persuasion, you know, there's different sort of scenarios there, but they're related. Where do I, where should I start? You, you mentioned about reading your book. I get that. But what is a, what is an absolutely critical piece to start in this journey to get better at persuasion and rhetoric? I think a really good place to start is a concept that I like to use um, when I introduce people to what rhetoric is. So think of human communication, incredibly varied, incredibly complex, also incredibly simple at times. But there are two divisions in how people do it. There are expressive people who don't know what they're going to say before they say it. And this is probably the majority of the population. They don't even know what they believe until they say it. They'll be saying something, and then later on they'll be thinking, why did I say that? I'm not even sure if I believe that. <laughs> and those are expressors. They don't edit uh, what's coming out of their mouth. And it doesn't form first in their brain. Like right now, I'm making words, but they are nowhere until they come out of my mouth. I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm just expressing. So that's natural to human beings, and it's a powerful way of doing communication. It's very easy for us to do it. On the other hand, are rhetoricians. Rhetoricians want to go in and work on every single syllable and the way it's said and when it is said and what visuals go with it. So a hyper rhetorical person doesn't want to talk until they've worked on the message. They want to maximize its effectiveness. And if you think about that for yourself, like, are you a, are you an expressive or a rhetorical person? I think I would say I'm more rhetorical. You speak slower. I mean, you seem to think a little bit before you talk. You I seem considered. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really always come out perfectly. <laughs> right. No, of course not. But like really rhetorical people will, they talk very slowly because mm. they're forming it in their heads before they talk or they've pre-written it, which a lot of what I said tonight is pre-written. It sounds conversational. I've said this stuff many times. Mm. I've lectured this stuff probably, you know, hundreds of times. And so a lot of what you're hearing are pre-worked scripts. Mm. And so I'm incredibly rhetorical. I like being expressive too. When I do creative work, expressiveness is what you want, but then you want a rhetorician to come along behind it, a mechanic and improve it. That's the cool thing about standup is standup is written dozens, if not hundreds of times, rewritten, rewritten, rewritten based on the audience's reaction and based on what you notice every time you go up and do it. So by the time it actually makes it to TV, you, you're probably seeing a script that's been written and performed 300 or more times with multiple different audiences. So there should be no flaws in it at that point. If there are, you have not done the work. So Dan, the thing that jumps out at me there is that you, you have a PhD in rhetoric, we've said numerous times, but the work that you do would, it may not require a PhD, but people would need to have my assumption is a very, very good understanding of rhetoric to be great at their jobs in the space that you played in, you know, stand up comedy, comedy scripts, writing TV and stuff. Is that a, a right assumption people do or actually no, they don't, but they still get by. 
I'd say it's a mix. Uh, salespeople are really interesting in this way because they they sell the same thing over and over again. And a lot of times they'll naturally hit on a line or a way of saying something or a facial mm. expression that works. Once it works, you're going to want to repeat it. It's going to be part of your routine because you know there's value in that script point or that performance point or the character mm. that you're playing. And you find this in every job. It's just sales. It's very uh, distinct because they know a lot of times their money depends on how well they deliver that script. So really good salespeople will end up knowing all the box, all the hesitations, all the resistances of customers. And as soon as they hear one, they've already got a script for answering it. And it's usually a fairly sophisticated script because it matters. And that's the other thing about rhetoric. You get rhetorical when there are high stakes in your messaging. So, you know, if you're in a situation where if you say the wrong thing, you're going to suffer, then you get very careful about your, your messages You go back to relationships during conflicts. A lot of times once conflicts start to come down and, and you have to do apologies and repair and things like that, get very careful about it. Mm. Or when they heighten and you know, like you're both losing it to the point where the emotions are overriding everything. A lot of times you'll in relationship counseling, they'll tell you to stop talking because you're no longer in control of your script. And you might say stuff far more vehemently than you mean it or than you want to say it. So you don't want to lose rhetorical control. On the other hand, you can't, it doesn't mean you're an automaton and then it's got to be super perfect script. It just maximize its effectiveness as best you can. Hmm. And it's great if you have a super rhetorician, if you have a team working with you, like most standups, professional standups have a team of writers. I mean, this guy sounds genius. Well, the genius may be sitting back in Arkansas, sending in jokes, mm. but the illusion of this master messenger message, ma master comedian is because it was team built, which is another thing about, there's a chapter in the, 21 Coliseums about professionalizing your rhetoric. Bring in as many great resources as you can when you have important messages to build. Because suddenly you'll get somebody, you know, in the third week at midnight who just says the perfect thing. You're like, oh my God. That's mm. that that may be like in comedy, if you write a certain joke that hits at a certain level. It can be a multi-million dollar joke because it becomes so popular that it changes everything. Jim, mm -hmm. you know who Jim Gaffigan is? You know the comedian Jim Gaffigan? Oh, I don't know. Well, anybody who wants to understand what I'm talking about, look up Jim Gaffigan on YouTube. Uh, Hot Pockets. He told a joke years ago around the product, the Hot Pocket, which is a pie that you put into a microwave and it changed his career from probably a $2,500 a week comedian to a hundred, $125,000 per show comedian mm -hmm. like that $2,500 a show <laughs> to over a hundred grand a show. One joke. Cause it was so good. Wow. C can you just talk a little bit about that? professionalization coliseum again because in in my storm you know team comes up working together as a team just expand on that concept a bit for us mate if you could well you did it here today on this podcast you know we showed up and there were 15 minutes before we started mm -hmm. we had mark who's producing this he's tech producing it he's like is this working is the are we streaming are we here <laughs> is the world ending what's going on because not having a tech guy or a tech person for a professional media event is a really bad idea. And I do it all the time. I completely do all my stuff <laughs> completely on my own. And I had a hard, di hard drive crash a while back and I lost five episodes. I'm like, oh, well, oh, my. nothing I can do about it now. But he, he's part of the team that makes this work. And there's probably been people along the way that it's not just Mark. You've probably gotten advice or 
some type of instruction. So. And so you are a product of professional rhetorical support. You're not as smooth as you seem, Brendan. Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. You should have seen the frantic nature of me before we sat down 15 minutes before the episode. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you've picked up skills. You know how to do these podcasts and how to seem like a nice guy and mm -hmm. interested and not get in the way of the guests. And you even told mm -hmm. me before we started, you gave me some direction. You're like, hey, if you monologue, it's fine. Don't worry about us having a conversation. You know, I'm trying to get a bunch of free information for my my listeners. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. But that was a direct that was a director's instruction. Mm. Mm. I love it. And uh, yeah, I, there's a, a few people on the live stream and I'll call out Dave and Matt and Kaz and Kaz on the line. She's a, a previous guest on the Culture Things Pod. Gave me some fantastic feedback around sort of interviewing and how they felt around the interview. So Kaz, thank and Matt. Thanks very much for that. But yeah, I mean, to me, I probably don't look at it as... Un unnatural is, is maybe what I, it just happens like to me i want to make sure i'm getting the best outcome for uh, not not only myself but for the guests so to me it's just a natural preparation thing yeah but drop that word natural that's not natural that's yeah that is a it's a professional attitude where you're like mm. i have a goal i need to organize this message so it achieves that goal mm. and that is the very heart of rhetoric mm. And if you really you're want saying to saying I'm a decent rhetorician already, I'm saying you're amazing. Like I, <laughs> I'm bowing before your prowess. <laughs> you're just trying to get me to do something. So you're building me up. <laughs> now, again, I don't, I don't do uh, manipulation. So if I'm, no, I know, up, I, know. I know. So what, what happens when two ethical rhetoricians get in the, in the boxing ring together around a, a hot topic that one's here and one's there? Well, an argument is supposed to be defined as two people trying to find the right answer. Like that is the nature of argumentation. It's called dialectics in, in philosophy is you have mm. many points of view or at least opposing points of view, and they're not trying to attack each other. Uh, and it doesn't have to be confrontational or, or conflictual. It's, hey, here's what I think. What do you think about that? They may find flaws in it or they may add to it, but that's supposed to be the definition of argumentation. There are all these variations of argumentation, which the dominant ones are conflict oriented. Like you see debate where they basically get up and they're having a verbal fight. Hmm. And that's not really the idea of philosophical argumentation. And then you get into academics with philosophical argumentation and they get very uh, attack oriented but they know their stuff really well. So they're not really offended by somebody who knows their stuff very well. Um, and I try to do this when I set goals for people and it's hard to do instruction while you're arguing with people. Mm. I learned in my marriage that um, <laughs> just because I understand what argument flaws are and I can explain them does not mean that the person using them wants to hear that or learn that stuff. I'll give you a really good example. Dad, I didn't need to get a PhD to know that. I'm sorry. Right. Intuitive, <laughs> right. Intuitive learning, right? <laughs> but what I can do is I can lay it out and show you what's happening. Like the idea, and you hear a lot of people, this one of the major argument flaws people have is multiplicity versus singularity. <clears throat> you can't argue multiple strands of information. You can't jump topics and get anything done in logic. Logic locks you into one thing until it's logically built. And if you want to jump around, if you want a lily pad in arguments, it's a bad system because you never, can't get everything done. Mm. And so uh, I've had relationships where they're multiplicitous arguers. They jump topics. We'll get halfway through something off to, yeah, but what about, and I'm, uh, and I'll be like, can we go back to, you know, the fact that you, you know, drop dishes every time you try to do dishes or whatever it is. <laughs> Can we go back to the fact that, you know, all the cups look like and he said, but that's me doing argument control and argument instruction, argument refereeing. And that's just not available in the world. Like 
communication gets very complex. It sprawls out of control, but the people in it aren't allowed to referee it. Hmm. So how do you win that one? <laughs> I got no idea. I've just got these images of two heavyweight boxers in the ring that know their stuff. They're, they're looking good, but they're not throwing any punches at each other. <laughs> just running around the ring looking good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I could see that. You mentioned the term flaws, and, and you started to talk about that a little bit. What are some of these flaws, the more common flaws, that you see around people influencing, persuading, or trying to? Um, you used one earlier. <laughs> Um, there's a list of fallacies, logical fallacies. They're kind of fun to look at, and there's all sorts of memes with them that are kind of fun. Uh, and if people were just trained in the logical fallacies, we'd be much further down the road because they tend to deconstruct uh, unethical rhetoric very quickly. Do you know what fallacy you use? Do you have any idea? No. Please enlighten me. <laughs> <laughs> More feedback. <laughs> it's a master fallacy, and people use it all the time, especially in politics. Uh, it's called false equivalency. So okay. I was talking about the right, and you said, doesn't the left do the same thing? Uh. It's a false equivalency. And what I did was I stepped back and I was like, well, they both do things, but they don't do the same things. Mm. So I'm like, that's a... <clears throat> I showed you that's a false equivalency. Like the, the right tends to use unethical techniques. Uh, the left doesn't. They can use annoying techniques that may not be fully worked out, like you know the whole thing with cancel culture right now mm. and stuff like that, but they're not the same techniques. So it's a false equivalency mm. to say they are. And people do that to you all the time. Like mm. and you hear politics, well, all, all politicians are you know, unethical and they all lie. And I'm like, it's not true. That's a false equivalency. Mm -hmm. What in the business world that you've been in for you know, particularly the last seven years or so with your media agency, what flaws do you see there or even an example of false equivalency that you've seen regularly? Uh, yeah, it's, it's rife with false equivalency. So to look at other, other um, competitors and see what they're doing, and then mm. to say, we should try some of that, like what they're doing. That's kind of a false equivalency mm. because you've got to look at the products. Are the products the same? Is the company the same? You know, if you have super similarity, then, okay, maybe you can adapt some of their successful techniques. But I typically find it to be fairly lazy thinking. Like instead of thinking your way through what's good for your product, you go to a quick thought, which is there's a similar product. Here's what they're doing. Let's try that. So you're trying to capitalize on their thinking, but it's a false equivalency. You're never the same as your competition. Hmm. There are almost always differentiators in the products and the way that you do them, all, all that stuff. So you got to be real careful of quick thinking and false equivalency is literally just a form of quick thinking. It's easy thinking. Hmm. So I see a lot of that with businesses, um, a lot of what I see in businesses is process issues. So we were talking earlier about me dealing with C-suite smart people and trying to get them out of the creative process. Isn't that, is that a false equivalency just saying that all C-suite people are smart people? Uh, I never claimed that they were all smart okay. people. Okay. But it says they, they're typically very smart. <laughs> I get it that you're smart, yada, yada, yada. They at least perceive themselves as smart. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I need to get them out of the creative process. And so uh, I need to differentiate what they are and what the creatives are. And if I do that well and distinctly, they will naturally come to the conclusion, I don't belong over here in the creative because creative process is very different than business process. Creative process is often very chaotic you can't tell who's valuable or how they're valuable. And Hollywood's figured a lot of this out because they've worked with creatives forever. Hollywood will allow a head writer, sometimes an executive producer also, to pick a staff of creatives. And I've been on staffs where, I swear, I, I was on a staff once where in the room, a lot of people are very funny. They're verbally funny. 
but then you send the quiet ones off to their office and they actually write all the script. And if you were just looking at it quantitatively of who seems the most entertaining and valuable in the room, you would always pick the verbal ones. But it turns mm -hmm. out the other people are actually writing the show. They just aren't verbal. And so you have to understand that kind of workforce in order to uh, put together a, a good team that knows how to work within, uh, everybody works within their strengths to get a strong product. Because you also can't take the verbal people out, even though they're not getting anything on the show. They put all the energy in the room that the quiet people kind of feed off of, and that's where they get all their ideas. And they're over there taking notes. Then they go back to their office, hone it, turn it into a mechanical joke that will work. And so there's a synergy between those two verbal and nonverbal writers. Mm. And you can't see it unless you know, unless you're a head writer and you've been in those rooms. So, so what color theme does that fall into? Um, is there, what was the creative? That's the uh, messaging probably like that might mm. be professional again, sort of situational, like you find persuasion is done different in every uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So like you go into a religion and they are going to do persuasion in a certain way. You go into a, you know, high dollar, big name corporation. You go into a comedy writer's room. And as you move through these, you will find you become incompetent almost instantly when you walk into other environments. Mm. So the smartest person is not the most useful person in a creative environment, but a creative person is not the most useful person in a smart environment. You know, it's just sometimes people can do multiple things, but almost everybody runs into incompetency as they move through situations. Mm. And part of it's knowing, and I think for a lot of people in their work, it's knowing where your natural inclinations fit that occupation you know, where you can succeed because it's already jived up with how you like to talk. Um, other people will feel oppressed forever by the institution that they're in because it doesn't fit the way they like to talk. I used to do this in education. Mm. I would always sit in the back of the room because I wanted to talk <laughs> while somebody else was lecturing. I wanted to comment on it without yeah. disrupting the room, right? Because I didn't want to disrupt it, but I wanted to also say my stuff. Mm. And in comedy clubs, that's called heckling. You're not allowed to talk <laughs> in education. What do you do with those sort of people, mate, when you're on the other side of it? It's not fair. It's not a fair fight. Like, <laughs> I, I think you've said that through some of your episodes. <laughs> yeah. I'll have a, somebody will say something or they'll disrupt the show. And I'll be like, you know, even if they get a laugh, I'm like, that oh, was good. Do you have anything else? Anything else prepared? No? Good. Because it turns out I do, and I've got a microphone. So let's go. Here we go. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you learn, I'm... it's a great, like, stand-up and sort of crowd work and dealing with hecklers is a great example of when you become a hyper rhetorician. Mm. I've done comedy in biker bars in Florida. I've done comedy at the top corporations. I did comedy at the Naval War College while I was also doing a seminar for them. I've done so much comedy and my brain is so fast at it now. It, you're never going to beat me in that situation mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. I just have too much and that doesn't apply everywhere else. But in that situation, yeah, you're going to have a hard time. You're pretty prepared. Just again, you know, I'm trying to link this back to your my world, own, your storm. my own storm, but the, what I think I'm hearing is that there is huge value in people spending time, I guess to use that word, in, in other people's storms to really start to understand the way that people think around things. Because if you can do that, then maybe you do have a little bit more of a, a leg in on potentially persuading them. Is, well, is that fair to say? Uh, it is, but there's, it just depends on your theory as a persuader. You can maximize your storm and mm -hmm. impose it on everybody. Mm -hmm. Perfectly valid. That's Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump never changed the way he talks. Yep. Or now he's talking to mm -hmm. You can like it or not like it, but you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. Same way with Biden. Biden has a certain way of talking. Mm 
mm-hmm. comes across as a nice person, likes to be rational and reasonable. That's what you're going to get. He mm-hmm. never breaks down. I remember the debate, the last debate when Trump was being super Trump and literally attacking him and wouldn't shut up. And Biden's just going. And finally, the worst thing he said was, can you stop this clown from talking? <laughs> that was the farthest. The he red got rag to the bull. Yeah, that was the farthest <laughs> Trump could push him mm. was clown. So that's pretty good discipline, man. Mm. I mean, he's been a politician for 40, 50 years. Forever. So it was it was really good discipline. I would have probably done different stuff to counter Trump, but um, I really admired Biden for staying with his messaging. Stay in your storm. So you can do that. You can maximize your storm. Mm. And you'll find a lot of times if you just stay on yours, others, they will come and adjust to you. And that's what I do a lot of times with rhetoric. I'm not mm. going to stop calling it rhetoric. You might want to call it branding and all that stuff, but I'm not going to switch over to that terminology because it's not mm. my terminology. Mm. I've come to understand it. I understand businesses and sort of what they're doing with that stuff, but I don't like yep. the limitations that it imposes. Mm. Or you can learn multiple storms and sort of breeze your way through the ones that you like and where you've got some some strengths. And you see politicians who do this too. I think over here, Obama was really good at that. Mm-hmm. He, he could adjust to multiple audiences and kind of talk their talk pretty well. He was pretty uh, chameleon-like, I think, in some ways with that. And Mm. so that's also a viable theory where you're like, I really want to learn this culture and the way these people do this so I can get good with them. Um, Mm. Yeah, I tend to do somewhere in the middle, I think. So who are, you you mentioned Obama, and maybe he's a great persuader. Who who are some of these, uh, apart from you, buddy, who are, oh, these, yeah. ha- who are these household name great persuaders out I'm there? I'm top three, at least. Um, <laughs> we'll mention the other two if you could. <laughs> sure. You know, it's kind of funny. I, I've been right, working on a stand-up show that orients people to rhetoric because I like to fuse stand-up into interesting information. Mm. And I was thinking about this question. Who are the two most uh, influential persuaders? Like the people who have been said no to the least. Uh, in life. And I came up with, I don't know if these are the most, but they're up there. Number one was Andre the Giant. Andre the, Andre the Giant. Giant was seven foot two, 525 pounds. <laughs> was it a wrestler? Many, yeah. Is he a wrestler? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many times do you think he heard no in his life? <laughs> How do you say no to a 525 pound wrestling dude? And he was sweet. He was a nice guy and everything else. But just just the sheer magnitude of this person, you're going to want to not, you know, say no to him. So that I was like I, need to, this, I feel like I need to hit the gym to kickstart my, right? my rhetoric journey. <laughs> Imposing power is one. And then on the other side, and I think, well, what's the opposite of that? Uh, maybe Marilyn Monroe. So whereas... Uh, Andre is imposing power. She is ultimate allure, like just the the feminine use of uh, persuasion, the feminine approach to persuasion of allure and offer and uh, charm and delight and all these type of things that she used would be, and you see males do this too, charm and delight are one of the superpowers in persuasion. So it goes on both sides and they're very powerful women that use imposing power, but they'll never be 525 pounds of Andre the giant (laughs) and, and no guy is ever going to be Marilyn Monroe. Like her estate still makes $25 million a year. She's been dead for 50 years. That's what, that, what kind of superpower, super persuasion she had. So, you know, persuasion sounds like a great way to, form passive income. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and you find like anybody can imprint themselves onto a culture, into the consciousness of a culture through character. And one of the chapters of the book is character. Like how do you construct a character that's going to work for your persuasion? And like I said, you've done that. You, you know, you're moderately, you're moderately conservatively dressed. You're friendly. You're not combative. You're trying to do good things for your audience. You care about the information you've established a a morality level to yourself as a host and you're, you pull it off very well. It seems very believable and authentic. So people are making moral 
judgments about you, but it's just a character. I'm mm. sure you've been a worse person than this. Yeah. Yeah. When I was 18. <laughs> <laughs> Not great, but we you live know. and learn. So we, we try to present the character that's going to be the most powerful for us. That's going to do the best work for us. And, you know, again, with ethical rhetoricians, you're trying to make sure that's an authentic part of who you are. And that if somebody says, is this all who you are, then you would talk about, no, I'm also this. But we shape our identities for other people all the time because we know it's going to improve the reception of our messages. Mm -hmm. I sometimes run into this, like when I do stand up, professor, I don't talk about being a professor a lot of times because I've, again, I work, I've worked biker bars and things like that. And I'm like, that's not going to go well. I want to seem more like them. And I'm from a working you don't class necessarily community. Fit that, so. that, you don't fit that stereotype of professor. Do you? You've got glasses. I got glasses, but no, I don't. <laughs> have you got I've lenses? Had people guess. Have, I've you had got people lenses? Guess. have you got lenses in those glasses? They're uh, just reading glasses. So <laughs> close up. I've had people guess what I do for a living. Nobody's ever said professor. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten bouncer, lawn work. <laughs> uh, never judge a book by its cover as they say yeah actually judging books by their cover mm. works pretty well does it did you ever notice that well <laughs> like, not, you not that in the advice, case we just talked like, about you know i know but you get the advice but it doesn't seem like it's true it's like i can pretty much tell like oh look there's the cover and there's some blurbs and i bet you i know what's in that book <laughs> if it's a mills and boone book you will yeah so Mate, let's let's start to wrap this up. I always like to ask my guests around their leadership impact and in their own journey. And you know, you've got unbelievable experience and, and various paths to your journey. What's what do you think's had the greatest impact on yourself in your journey around leadership? Because you're a leader in your field. Hmm. There was a point when I remember I was a reader my whole life. Like I grew up in Kentucky in a very working class neighborhood and it wasn't a education centric neighborhood. It was a work centric neighborhood. It was just on the edge of farmland. And, and so the things I valued weren't particularly valued in that culture, but I learned very early that reading escaped all that it transcended all your location and your limitations. And the people who wrote books were really smart to, uh, interesting to listen to and their when you read their stuff. And so, you know, I was a reader, I was a consumer forever and ever and ever. I would consume information and learn and learn and learn. And then I remember at some point, uh, I watched the Disney film Fantasia, or maybe it was listening to the Sting song Ring Around My Finger, where there's this tradition in old storytelling of the apprentice becoming the master suddenly you're just casting spells and you probably don't feel like you're ready to cast spells, but everybody else seems to be okay with it. <laughs> and so I remember moving from consumer over to producer mm. and being like, you know what? I think I've consumed enough. And I read forever voraciously. And I really do feel like I've kind of filled up my brain in some ways. Mm. And now just every day I just produce, like I write and I try to, think about this stuff and do podcasts, write books, because I'm trying to take all the stuff that I've learned and filter it out in a way that can be useful to other people mm. from my brain, not to reconstruct what somebody else has said, but like when I think about it, what, how do I see it? And so I think that was the main thing of starting to think yourself as a producer of things, not a consumer of things so much. Mm. That was mm. huge. And I think that that's a moment when, when you can start doing that, you start taking the responsibilities of being a good producer, of putting out good stuff into the world that people can actively use. And one of the cool things, the really cool things about rhetoric is it's meant to be used. It's not philosophy. It's linguistic philosophy, mm. which means it's language in use. So the only reason to study it is to see how it's affecting people. And so it doesn't matter like if I learn this great phrase or this great way of persuading it doesn't matter until I go test it on people. And then if it's working, then you can go, hey, this is a technique that we should all learn and try to use together. 
And on the other hand, it, it counteracts bad effects, which is what started me into this path again about a year ago with the uh, podcast and the book and everything. It's like, there's some dangerous rhetoric swirling around democracies right now. I think I, I better, you know, do set up about some armaments. It. See if I can teach some of the military, the rhetorical military, to shoot some of this stuff down. <laughs> like, I really like that. I like that advice, that sort of, you know, consumer to producer. Uh, I guess the, the world that you live in and the, you know, the, the rhetoric side of things, you're always, I don't know, you'd always be consuming, wouldn't you? You know, this conversation, you consume certain things. I know you spend a bit of time on Lunch Club, which is how ultimately yourself and Mark met and then we met. So maybe you're just consuming in a different pattern, less of the, less of the reading. But, you know, you, you are noticing all sorts of stuff. That's my take on it. Yeah, but I instantly turn it into production. Mm, so, like, I mm. I take notes on all my lunch club meetings. Mm. I remember you saying that, actually. I'll find something interesting that I'm thinking while they're talking, or I'll notice something about their communication. And that's partly because I'm writing a book on the art of conversation mm. uh, in business. Because I, th I think that I hear a lot of people teaching communication skills in business. And they have almost no qualifications to teach mm. communication skills. So I'm like, why don't y'all learn to, again, go to the formal depth uh, stuff that's actually been studied, like in conversational analysis. And you'll find that if you learn those uh, mechanics from people who deep study it, it'll just elevate everything you do. Mm. You did a, a thing at the beginning here where you set a conversational rule for us on turns. Like you consciously told me it's okay to take a long turn mm. and to not give the turns back to me. That's an unnatural form of conversation. It's usually a dysfunctional form of conversation. If somebody does that to you in a natural conversation, it annoys you. Mm. And that happens all the time on lunch club. And I'll, I'll, I have a whole way of auditing people. I'm like, here's all the dysfunctions. I had three lunch clubs today. I was doing them 10 minutes just for fun. <laughs> And they were all awful. Mm. And I wanted to tell the person, I, I don't because that's not what they're signed up for. Hey, you only talk about yourself. You've not asked me a single question or a follow-up probe question to anything I've said. That is dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to teach that stuff to the world because it would make a big difference in their lives. So that's how many people walk around with dysfunctional communication structures mm -hmm. and carry them into their, their relationships, their families, their work, and they never fix them. And they're mm -hmm. literally not deep psychological things you have to go and talk to a therapist for 40 years about. They're mechanical <laughs> ways that you learn to do communication. Mm -hmm. Like turns should be short. They should be traded back and forth. You should follow up once or twice with probe questions. And that's a, that is the most functional form of communication in a conversation. But I find business people all the time can't do it. Mm. Yeah. I, I hear you and I've experienced that many, many times myself. I, I've got this vision again, and maybe this is back to your stand up comedy side. I'm surprised you don't have like a, you know, a virtual screen that just you hit a button and that whole dysfunctional thing comes up above your head. I think you need to try that, buddy. <laughs> a visual trigger. Dysfunction. Dysfunction. Yeah, absolutely. Dysfunction. It, that, that fits into the messaging coliseum. So it's, uh, I think it's definitely one of those I, things to love try, it. right? I, good, good rhetoric work there, buddy. You, <laughs> you just, little neon flashing sign to affect how people communicate. That's good work. I look, well, can I say I look forward to seeing it, but not to be the, uh, the person that you do it to, hopefully. <laughs> well, again, this goes back to uh, ethic, ethical approaches. Like none of this is to punish people. It's not to make you feel bad about your skills mm. or your rhetoric or anything else. It's to say you haven't been trained in most of this. Ergo, you're probably not going to know it. Mm. But it's all trainable. It's all learnable. It's not super esoteric. Yep. It just takes time to, to see it, start to practice it, incorporate it into your lives. And then you can get better at it. Like dysfunction mm. to me is, it's just habitual. It's not something you're born with. Like I had another person today who said, I'm an introvert and I don't really like to talk that much to people. And I'm like, you know what that really means? That means I don't care whether you enjoy my conversation. <laughs> 
you can't hide behind introvert mm. and then give people a bad <clears throat> conversational experience. Sorry. Mm. That's a mm. psychological dodge. You may be an introvert, maybe a psych true psychological thing. It doesn't matter to a communication person. You are not taking turns when I'm giving them to you. Like literally sitting there going, and I just let it sit until they <laughs> talked. <laughs> Cause I'm like, you're giving me a bad conversational experience here. And, uh, 10 minutes. I cut it off. I'm like, Hey, it's been fun talking to you. You gotta go. <laughs> well, mate, on that note, I mean, again, I could sit here and talk to you for hours. I think, uh, the, you know, I appreciate the respect you've shown me and just, you know, the conversation we've had today. And I, I've already just in two conversations, this one and the, the last one we had for an hour or so, have learnt an unbelievable amount and then a whole heap of package of information that I'm garnering from your from your book. And I've written all sorts of notes from that and highlighted certain things. I'm one of those people I can I don't like highlighting in physical books. I'm a bit anal like that, but highlighting on ebooks is absolutely fantastic. I'm really comfortable with that. So I've got all sorts of highlights through yours. Mate, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, the link between what you do and I feel a bit more not a lot more, but I, I want to get on that journey. I feel a bit more educated around rhetoric and, and how we can use that really in an ethical way, absolutely, uh, you know, to help and, and to grow in our journeys, which ultimately what we're about and what leadership is about, mate. So I appreciate you and thank you for being an absolutely fantastic guest and the first PhD of rhetorician on the Culture of Things podcast, <laughs> buddy. Well, I, I'll, with, I'll put with it two up. Emmy nominations. My list of my list of accomplishments has grown by one. So it's been, <laughs> been super fun, man. You are. You're fun to talk to, and you're very authentic and very giving. So yeah, it's been a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you, mate. Great to chat. These takeaways are a chance to bring you back from Dan's verbal storm to mine. In today's episode, we met Dr. Dan French. As I said in the intro, he's literally the only person in the world with two Emmy nominations for late night comedy writing and a PhD in rhetoric. What a fascinating combination of skills to develop. I was lucky enough to spend some time with Dan a few weeks ago, and ever since, I've been excited to host him on the podcast and to learn more about rhetoric and the art of ethical persuasion. I've read his most recent book, The 21 Coliseums of Persuasion, and I've also signed up for his 25 week master persuasion course. If this episode has whet your appetite for rhetoric and persuasion, I highly recommend buying his book and doing the course. And if you think it might be too costly, think again. His book is $12 on Kindle and his 25 week course is US $25. Why so cheap? Because he wants everyone to take the course. These were my three key takeaways from my conversation with Dan. My first key takeaway, leaders are great rhetoricians. The CEO should be the head rhetorician. They know how to choose their words for powerful messaging. They understand how to influence and they know how to move around the 21 Colosseums ethically. Great leaders, are great rhetoricians. My second key takeaway, leaders use ethical persuasion techniques. Simply put, they are transparent in their dealings. They are open, honest, and use this to have genuine conversations. Unethical persuasion techniques involve hiding your motives. Simply put, being dodgy. Don't be dodgy, be a leader who is transparent in your dealings. My third key takeaway, leaders act on their limits. Not only do they know their strengths and weaknesses, they use this understanding as a basis for action. When a leader stops acting like an expert on everything, it allows for real conversations to happen. As a leader, act on your limits and the results will be better for everyone. So in summary, my three key takeaways were, leaders are great rhetoricians. Leaders use ethical persuasion techniques and leaders act on their limits. If you wanna talk culture, leadership or teamwork, if you've got any questions or feedback about the episode, you can leave me a comment on the socials 
or you can leave me a voice message at thecultureofthings.com. Thanks for joining me. And remember, the best outcome is on the other side of a genuine conversation.